Hi everyone, welcome. This is National Master Dennis Montecrucis, and today and for the next few weeks, actually for the next several months, we're going to do something a little bit different. So the uh, United States Chess League finished their season about a month or so ago, maybe two months ago now, and for the next um, 20 weeks they're going to be releasing, one week at a time, the uh, results for their, their Game of the Year competition. So there are 20 games, as I mentioned, and the way it works is this. There were 13 games of the week during the uh, regular season as voted by another panel of judges, and then they also added seven wild card games into the mix. And so out of that pool of 20 games, a group of five judges, including myself, Grandmaster Alex Shabalov, uh, Jennifer Shahadi, and a couple of other players, are all deciding the fate of these 20 games. And so today we're going to take, take a look at the game that was voted number 20, and um, we'll count them down one week at a time. First, they'll be available on the uh, the USCL website, with you know be able to see the, the the score of the game there, and also the judges' comments. And then I'll present the game on our uh, Chess Videos TV broadcast. So uh, actually, before I, I go on, I'll also throw in one other plug, one for for my blog. So uh, chess fans are more than welcome to uh, to check that out. So it's at chessmind dot powerblogs dot com no w's just http chessmind dot powerblogs dot com okay so the ad's over and again we'll take a look at our first game here and this is between Jay Bonin who is playing for the New York team against Dennis Shmelov who is playing for Boston's team and Boston was the uh, the runner up in this year's league competition now Jay Bonin many of you will know is uh, a popular and um, incredibly active international master from from the New York area. The guy plays something between 300 and 600 games a year, every year. Uh, the guy's appetite and love of the game is just astounding, really. And, um, you know, he's had some tremendous results in his, in his life, and, uh, you know, it ha certainly had some bad results, too. So for many people, he's the, the first international master they ever beat. But on the other hand, I mean, he's beaten many, many grandmasters. He's beaten um, Kamsky, for example, several times, just to, to start from someone who's very far towards the top of the pile. Uh, Shmelov is a younger player, but he's, he's quite good, and he uh, seems to be well on his way to achieving an international master title, at least judging by his, his recent results. Okay, so Bonin had white in this game, and we'll go ahead and begin here. He played the move b3, which is certainly a bit unusual. And uh, I have to say about Bonin's repertoire, in part probably because he just plays so often, uh, I'm sure he mixes things up just to, to keep things from being too stale. But Generally speaking, he plays left left side openings, left handed openings. So he'll play d4, he'll play c4, knight f3, which is kind of an honorary queen pawn opening. And here we have b3. Now, my preference would be for e5, but Shmelov plays knight f6, and the players head for a symmetrical English, in particular the so called hedgehog variation, which I'll explain in a moment. Now, here black could play d5, that would avoid a hedgehog, but he plays d6 d4, and takes. So it's kind of a, a Sicilian-like pawn structure. Certainly if white were to play e4, we would have a kind of fundamental um, Sicilian-type pawn structure. All right, now white has two choices here. Which way to recapture? Queen takes d4 is the most common, and this takes us to the heart of the traditional hedgehog after the move a6. Now the reason this is called a hedgehog, for those of you who are unfamiliar with this, this opening idea, is that the pawns on a6, b6, d6, and e6, in a sense, resemble the quills of a hedgehog. So a hedgehog is a very passive open or very passive animal, and uh, you know it doesn't attack anything except for maybe some leaves of grass. I mean, it's it's a it's not a not a carnivorous animal, but because of those spikes, th its quills, it poses a a very serious defensive challenge. So an animal that wants to get at it has to be quite careful that it doesn't end up with a mouthful of, of sharp quills. And so it is here, metaphorically speaking, in, in this variation. So black isn't gaining a lot of space by arranging his pawns and pieces in this way, but white has to be very careful about how he proceeds. Not only because these pawns cover pretty much uh, almost the entire fifth rank here, but also because there's a, a latent dynamism in the structure. Black will, will often continue with moves like knight to d7, queen to c7, put the rooks on 
the uh, well the C file and then either the E file or the D file. The queen drops back to B8 and sometimes goes to A8. And what Black is hoping for is to play for B5 or D5. And here the quills get active, you might say. So uh, if if Black can break White's central control with either of those two moves, he can end up with really an excellent position. So uh, if he gets in B5, it'll often turn into a very favorable kind of Sicilian structure where he's got the extra pawn in the center, uh, whereas d5 is much more, at least in this double fee and keto kind of setup, uh, it can turn out to be a, a kind of a liquidating move. But in any case, it's, uh, it becomes a very tense sort of, sort of game. Very patient, both sides have to be very patient, but when uh, black does go for one of these breaks, the game can become quite wild. Okay, in any case, Bonin played knight takes d4, which tends to lead to, to quieter positions than the queen takes d4 hedgehog. But many of the same themes still apply. Okay, so takes and takes, a6. And now we have kind of an interesting uh, little maneuver by Bonin. So he plays queen to d3, and after queen to c7, he plays queen to f3. Now that might look kind of artificial. I mean, why not play e3, and then after rook to a7, queen to f3. I mean, the pawn is useful on e3. It protects the knight on d4. And um, in some cases, as we'll see later on in the game, maybe protects a pawn on f4 if white goes for a general king-sided advance with f4, g4, g5, and so on. Well, we'll see the idea. And I'm not sure that Bonin's move is better than this e3, queen, f3 idea, but we'll certainly see its value. So queen to d3, queen c7, queen f3. So this is a very, it's a very good place for the queen, so it controls the long diagonal. In particular, it controls the c6 square, so black isn't going to put anything here for at least a while. And, um, and it, of course, it also shields the diagonal to his own king, so he's keeping himself a bit safe. Okay, black plays rook to a7, rook a to c1. And the idea behind this is to, uh, or one idea, is to prevent well, to impede the b5 and d5 advances. So with the opposition of the, the rook to the queen, it makes that a little bit less uh, less friendly for black. But also there's a subtler tactical idea, which everyone who plays either side of a hedgehog should know about. So let's say black plays rook to c8, and then after rook f to d1 plays knight to c6. Well, here there's a nice little trick. Knight c to b5. Well, actually, maybe black can play knight takes d4 and neutralize it. But let's say he plays a takes b5. Well, then there's c takes b5, and white regains the piece, because if knight takes d4, rook c7, knight f3, it's important that it's not with check. If the king was on g1, this would be impossible. Rook c8, and then we take the knight, and white's winning. So this knight to b5 idea, or more commonly, the knight to d5 idea, of course, the queen can't be on f3 for that to work, because... After knight to d5, pawn takes, pawn takes. Well, actually, yeah, I guess it would still work here, so maybe we can do that. All right, so I'm not calculating as uh, well as I ought to, I guess, in, in that respect. Maybe knight takes d4, though. Yeah, so knight takes d4, maybe white's forced to play knight e7, queen e7, bishop d4. Anyway, you see the, the basic idea. So knight to d5, if pawn takes, pawn takes, and... White is, is hoping to regain the piece because of this pin on this file. And uh, knight takes d4 should work the exact same way. So this is this is good for white. Okay, so all that's just to say that's a typical idea behind rook a to c1. So it impedes black's freeing moves with the b and d pawns while also introducing, in some cases, this the idea of knight to d5, especially when black has put a knight on c6. Okay. Now, here black plays knight f to d7, and this might look kind of artificial, but the point is this, that if black plays knight b to d7, white has knight to c6, forking the rook and the bishop, and while it doesn't win material, thanks to knight to e5, after this trade, white has a clean queenside majority, so black's only got two pawns over here, but while black has five on four on the king side, because these pawns are doubled, it makes it harder for black to, to force a pass pawn down the road. So this would be an advantageous position for white. So by playing knight f to d7, the c6 square remains fully covered. Okay. Furthermore, after rook f to d1, knight e5, queen e4, knight b to d7, white is kind of forced to play king g1 here. So this is a, a nice move by Bonin. 
clearing G2 for the queen. So we can keep control of the diagonal. And now this is the uh, a moment that I wanted to point out. Because white's pawn is still on E2, there's no knight to D3. So he doesn't have to worry about knight E or knight C to D3. So either one of these guys. Forking the rook and the bishop. So that, I think, is the fundamental strength of this queen D3, queen F3 maneuver, as opposed to E3 and queen F3. So it's kind of subtle, and if you wondered about it back at the time, now you, now you have an idea. Okay, so black plays rook to C8 here. And now, uh, Bowden chooses kind of an interesting plan. So he could play F4, and then knight to E4, and I think he's very, very slightly better here, but it's not all that interesting. So instead, Bowden goes for something a little bit more aggressive. He plays queen to H3, and his idea is similar to uh, one idea of white in the, uh, the Richter Rouser variation of the classical Sicilian. He wants to play f4 and f5 and put pressure on this pawn on e6. Especially you can imagine some scenario where he also plays b4, so he kicks this knight away, and then black is pretty much forced to do something with the pawn on e6. So he's either going to have to push it to e5, if that's possible at the time, or play e takes f5. And that's going to allow white the beautiful d5 square for one knight, and maybe the f5 square for the other knight. So that's a very serious positional threat that black has to deal with. Now I think the best way for him to have dealt with it is with queen to d7, f4, and the knight to c6. So I think this, pos this position is equal. Um, he's able to prevent white from really uh, doing anything too serious with f5, because he can just leave the pawn in place. So after f5, he could simply swap off the knights, play bishop to f6, and he's okay. Well, instead, though, after queen h3, he played bishop to f6, and now, I think with very subtle play, white could have gained an advantage. So he played f4, but I think the best move was b4. And here black has a couple of options. Both, I think, lead to white advantages. So if he goes back to d7, then knight to e4. And now white has pressure against d6. He's got pressure against e6. And if black tries taking on c4, very bad things happen to him. So knight e6, fe, queen e6. And now knight takes d6 is just crushing. So the threat is to give smothered mate. So um, if you don't know what it is, this will be very useful for you. So pay, pay careful attention, because this is a tactical idea that just comes up in all kinds of situations. And it's, it's just crucial to know it. So knight f7, king g8, knight h6. If the king goes to f8, then queen f7 is mate. And after king to h8, white has a very pretty mate in two. It's, it's elementary, but... If you don't know it, if you've never seen it before, again, it's absolutely essential that you you learn this idea. So there we go. It's called a smothered mate, obviously because the uh, the black king is locked in. He's smothered by his own pieces. Okay, so because of that threat, and also the threat to take on c8, and the threat to take on c4, black is just busted, and he's got nothing better than to take the knight. But after white just keeps taking things, he's simply winning. So white has a queen and two pawns for a rook and a knight, which is a more than adequate material advantage. Plus, he's going to win the b6 pawn, too. Okay, <clears throat> so after b4, knight c to d7, knight e4, knight c4, knight e6 is hopeless for black. All right, if b4, if he tries knight takes c4 right away, here there's a very, very complicated line. So if you're a really strong player, I'd recommend stopping the uh, recording for maybe 5, 10 minutes and trying to figure out how white wins against best play, or at least gets a big advantage. All right, if you're not as strong, follow me for a couple more moves and then try to follow, try to figure it out. So b takes c5, d takes c5. So it's key that black tries this, and then after knight takes e6, queen c6. Okay, f takes e6 is just easy, because you take the pawn with check, and then you take the knight, and you're just up a full piece. But after queen to c6, it's not quite so obvious how white's winning, because black, even though he's a piece down, He's threatening the knight, and he's threatening the bishop here. So he's got a double attack going. So the way to win here is really beautiful. It's knight to d5, and this threatens mate. So if, for example, knight takes b2, knight f6 check. Okay, if the king goes over, queen h7 is mate. And if he takes on f6, then queen g4 and queen g7 is mate. It's very attractive. Um, so knight takes b2 is right out. But what about bishop takes b2? So how does white win in this position? So again, you know, maybe stop the tape for 
the tape. Stop the recording for about 30 seconds a minute and see if you can figure out what white should do in this position. So it looks like black is okay. He's actually up a pawn, um, and he's still got a double attack. So he's threatening the rook on c1. He's threatening the knight on e6. Okay, so the right move is knight e to c7. So it's a beautiful move. So it, it's, uh, it's an interference move. So it blocks the rook on a7's control over e7. So now white threatens the fork here. It's also a clearance move. Now white's threatening to play queen takes c8. And of course, he's still threatening rook c4 as well. So black can take on c7. White takes, and again is threatening queen takes c8. So he's got to take that. And now rook c4. And so instead of losing his knight on e6 for nothing, white managed to, uh, to get a rook for a couple of pieces there while winning the knight on c4 for free. So the end result is that he's up the exchange for a pawn. And because black's bishop has no really good squares, it doesn't have d4, for example, white's clearly better. Not winning yet, but clearly better. OK, well, that was Bonin's last really good try, really good chance for an advantage for a long, 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 long time. OK, white played f4. And this is a mistake. Small mistake. Knight c6 takes, takes, queen g2. And now we're kind of back to a more solid sort of position. Now, if black were to take, I think white's a little bit better here. Nothing dramatic, but a little bit better. But Shmelov rightly played queen c7. But now the position sharpens back up again. So Bonin plays g4. And his idea is quite logical. He wants to play g5. And after the bishop retreats, then to play b4. Knight retreats, then play knight to e4. And now white's got some very promising ideas in this position. So we'd like to play knight's f6 check, maybe. Or just very simply play h4, h5, h6. And this is going to cause all kinds of weaknesses and disharmony in the black king side. And meanwhile, black doesn't really have any counterplay. Again, this rook on c1 impedes both d5 and b5. So what's black going to do? This would be a tough position for him to play. So he doesn't really want to allow g5. So the best move is the move that Shmelov played. He played h6. Now, if white plays g5 here, it's not so good. Black would just trade pawns and play bishop to e5. So now he keeps control over the long diagonal. And white's pawn structure is also a little bit fishy, too. So if his attack doesn't work, he's going to have to, to pay the price down the road. So instead of g5, Bonin played h4. And he'd like to play g5 now once again. So Shmelov is positionally forced to play bishop takes h4. All right, now in this position, I think Bonin played inaccurately. Um, well, I'm, don't just think it, I'm pretty sure about it. What he had to play was b4, and only after knight to d7, then g5. Okay, and after h takes g5, both knight to e4 and f takes g5 give white, I think, good compensation for the pawn. Um, I wouldn't say he's better, but he certainly has, has play. So he's threatening to play queen to g4, taking advantage of the poor bishop. Also threatening to play knight to e4, which will shore up the, uh, the, the g5 pawn. It protects the c4 pawn indirectly. It hits d6. And in some cases, prepares knight to f6 as well. So this would be a very, very sharp position, and it would just be anyone's game. Unfortunately, Bonin played g5. And I think he believed he could just play b4 later on. So the game continued h6, g5, f, g5, again threatening queen to g4, queen to e7, and now b4. And I'm sure he was thinking, at least from a ways back, that black would retreat the knight, let's say to d7. And then after knight to e4, again, he's got a terrific position. So he's hitting d6, he's threatening g4, queen g4, and he's threatening knight to f6 check as well, which could be quite dangerous for black. Certainly, black can't recapture either way. So this would be a really nice position for Bonin. But the problem is that after b4, well, you guys figure out the problem. So again, you might want to pause, pause the recording for a few minutes and try to work out what black's best, um, best continuation is. And not just the first move, but, but several moves in, because really it's part of a, a whole combination. OK. Well, the move that was played by, by Shmelov was bishop takes on g5, and this is just a winning move. Bonin really has to take the knight now. I mean, otherwise, he's just down two pawns for absolutely nothing. So he takes. And now, probably the best move, the most accurate move, is rook takes c5. 
followed by bishop to e3 check, and then the idea is to play rook to g5. Though maybe rook to f5 or rook h5 will be quite strong, or even queen to h4. So, I mean, black just has so many attacking options at his disposal here that white is just crushed in this position. But his move, I think, is okay, too. So we play bishop to e3, and uh, if the king goes to h file, rook takes c5 is great. So king f1 happened. And um, now maybe rook takes c5 is still okay. Which Melov played is, is still winning too, but it's his margin is getting a little bit smaller here. So you play queen f6 check, queen f3. And now again, see if you can figure out what he ought to play here, what the best way for black to continue um, is. Should he trade queens? Should he take the rook on c c1? Should he play rook take c5? Maybe something else? So what should he do? Okay, well the answer is he should play queen to g5. So this threatens queen to g1 mate. And after the forced queen to g2, again, rook takes c5 is just devastating. So the threat is to play rook to f5 check. And white has just no, no answer to this. If he tra takes the queen on g5, rook takes g5, and rook to g1 is mate next move no matter what. So this would have would have won very very easily and very forcefully for Schmelov. It would have been a, a very nice uh, conclusion to a reasonably played game. I mean, Bonin did miss the one opportunity, but um, that aside, I would say Schmelov's play was pretty good. However, he missed this. So he played queen takes f3. And after e takes f3, bishop takes c1, c takes b6 happened, and now the position is not completely clear. So rook came over, Bishop takes, rook takes, uh, bishop to e3. He could play c5 with the cute idea that if rook takes c5, knight a4, black would probably just play d takes c5, and this would be kind of like the game. So bishop to e3, rook to b2, c5. So it's, an, it's a nice move. He's going to lose the pawn anyway, so he might as well close the c-file and mess up black's structure a bit. d takes c5. Now, it might be kind of fun in this position to think, what's the least likely white unit to be the big star of the show here? So you would think, well, you know, the rook would be the most obvious choice or one of the pieces. So it turns out that this A pawn is going down the road to be what kills black, remarkably. Now here, black is absolutely fine. I mean, he's clearly better, but there's still work to be done. So rook to d6, and here Shmelov makes an error. A very plausible error, but an error nonetheless. So he plays rook to c2. This is really logical. I mean, the idea is to play rook to b8 and double on the seventh rank. Well, second rank, his seventh. But here, uncharacteristically, that really won't achieve very much. So Bonin plays bishop to d2. And now we'll see if, if black carries out the idea, rook to b8, king to e1, rook b to b2, and now king to d1. It turns out that black has kind of mousetrapped both of his own rooks. So there's nothing for him to attack here. And, uh, I mean, he can't threaten anything, really. And uh, the rooks can't get back out. Now, the only problem for white, unfortunately, is that he really can't do anything with this, this situation either. So if black just pushes his kingside pawns, for example, white's probably going to have to play bishop to e1 and, and then do something. But he's OK. I mean, this, this position is really not so great for black at all. The, the rooks are, are overextended. So after bishop to d2, Shmelov realized that that was a, a non-starter. He played king to f8, king e1, a5, king d1, rook b2, and he kicks them all, kicks all the rooks out. Now here I think Bonin should have played king to c2. So this would have been a nice, patient move. It takes control over over d3, and uh, White is just very, very solid here. So it's uh, it's not that he's going to win or anything, but he keeps the intruders out. And um, he's maybe going to bother, when he can, the a5 and or c5 pawns. And uh, it's hard for black to win. All right. Unfortunately, now both players start making some serious mistakes. They, they kind of alternate. So Bonin played a4. And this move I don't like because it's giving up the b4 and b3 squares. Um, the b3 square in case of, let's say, a move like c4. Also, maybe he could have used the tempo to guard the d3 squares I mentioned with king to c2. So black's best would have been rook to d8, and after, let's say, rook to a6, rook a8, and now rook to d3. 
So this wouldn't have been available for white, uh, for black, pardon me, had uh, white chosen king to c2. Okay, so white gave up uh, an opportunity to black, but black returned the favor with king to e7. Okay, so here again they made an error. So he should have played rook to a6, and then just kept his rook on whichever open file uh, he was permitted. Instead he played a very natural move. He played knight to e4, which looks pretty good. I mean, it's hitting the c5 pawn, and it activates the piece. Maybe the bishop can come to c3. Uh, now, the refutation of this move, though, is, is kind of an ironic one. So he should have played f5, which looks like the most obvious move at first, and it looks like an obviously bad move at second. But it turns out, on third glance, that it really is good. So bishop to g5, the seeming problem with it, king f7. And now if rook to d7 check, king g6 just wins a piece. So white should move the knight to c3, he should retreat. But after rook to h8, now both of black's rooks are active, so they found a way into the game. Well, the b file was always going, but now the h file is going to prove quite useful for a black rook as well. So that's what should have happened, but after knight to e4, black played rook to d8. And now the position is actually equal, incredibly. So rook to a6, rook a8. He could play rook to c6 here, but rook to b6 was fine too. Rook d to b8. But now he should have played rook to c6. And again, this just seems to be equal. White's pieces are all just very, very active. Unfortunately, he made a very bad decision here. He played rook to b5. Now, the problem with this is that even though he gets a passed pawn after this exchange, it's much, much harder for white to really play actively without a rook. So when he had the rook, knight, and bishop all working together, those pieces can, can create a symphony of beautiful music. The knight and the bishop, though, are uh, a bit more like the, uh, a bit more like William Hung on American Idol. So they, uh, they, they don't work quite so well together. They, they're not as, uh, as harmonious in their operation as uh, they would be with a rook involved as well. So what Black now decides to do is to, with proper preparation, starting with rook to b8, bring his king over to the queen side to deal with the b pawn. And then he's going to bring his rook to the h file. And you would think, with the rook active going after the f pawn and the three kingside pawns for black, it should be a pretty routine win. I mean, he's got a queenside majority. He's got a huge, king, well, he's got a two to one queenside majority. He's got a three to one kingside majority. How can white be in the game? But he is, surprisingly. So bishop to e3, taking aim at the c pawn, threatening knight to e4. So black plays f5, which is useful. The one drawback to f5 is that, I mean, ideally he'd like to advance the pawns. Uh, he'd like to take a grip on the dark square. So he'd like to be able to play g5, and he's not going to be able to do that now. So uh, minor minor hassle, but nothing serious. So f5, king b2, rook h8, and now knight to a4. Okay, so black, I mean, black could play rook to c8, which would be really passive. And it wouldn't really help anyway, because probably king c3. So yeah, we can take a quick look at this. If rook to c8, king c3. And he's got to play king c4 and win the pawn anyway, because king to d5 is a blunder on account of knight to b6 check. So the pawn is a goner anyway. There's no real sense in going passive. So rook to h2 check, king b3, rook to h3, king to c4. Now, uh, quickly here, I think maybe black has a win, but it's very subtle. Uh, or no, I'm, he does have a win at this point, I'm sorry. It, it, this one is, I think, clear. There's another win that I found a couple of moves before that's a bit more subtle. So rook to h4 check. <coughs> um, king to b3 would be bad because rook to b4 check, obviously. So f4 is forced. And now g5. And so black is, because of this pin, the g pawn is able to get into the action. He's able to get the three pawns rolling. And um, even though the white pawn on b5 Will, will cause some danger, it, um, it's not quite enough, as we'll see. Some very nice variations. Okay, so uh, bishop c5 isn't so good. So the best is knight takes c5. Okay, so knight c5, gf, bishop f2, here, a4. So we make all of these fairly obligatory moves. And, um, and now the best is, I believe, bishop to g1. Oops, no, sorry. Bishop to f2, I think, is the best move. So let me actually promote this variation. All right, so now the threat is to play knight to c5 check. 
And this is going to cause Black a lot of trouble unless he plays rook takes f2. But let's think about this here. After knight to d3, it looks as if white's ready to play knight c5, king c6, b7, and win. Or at least, you know, maybe draw. So this is a really good position to figure out what black ought to do. So again, I, I encourage you to stop the recording for a couple of minutes and try to calculate out to the finish how black ought to play this position if he can win. He can, but it requires some accuracy. Okay, well here's the answer to the, to the question. So the right move, actually either pawn push wins, but you have to see the, the follow-up move, that's the key. So a2, knight to c5 check, and now you got three, three choices, two are bad. One's really bad, and one's good. Okay, so if king to b8, you actually lose. King to c6, queen, knight to d7, and now, okay, you could also go to a8, that's no better. So if king to a8, b7, king a7, b8, queen, here, and then various mates, queen to b6 or queen to a8 mate. Okay, if you go to c8, it's a little bit better, but not better enough. b7, b8, queen f8 mate. Not good. Okay, so we go back. We see the king to b8 was no good. Okay, how about king to c8? Well, this doesn't work really either, but at least it's a draw this time. Okay, again, you don't want to go to b8 because you get mated. Knight to d7, b8, queen, queen to b6, or queen to a8 mate. So king to d8. And here, um, even if white were somehow to win all three pawns, which I don't think he should, even then it would be a draw. So queen and knight versus queen is a draw, assuming it's not a position where there's some immediate tactic winning the queen or forcing mate. So let's say a normal position, queen knight versus queen, if it's the queen side to move, usually, and he's not in check, uh, usually it's a draw, and this would be a draw for sure. Okay, so that's better than losing, but it's not success. So the right move is king to a8, and the key point is that after king c6, queens, b7, there's king to a7. So we have that square as a flight square, and that gives black time to survive. Or, um, and it was also crucial to note that king to a6 is no good because of a1 queen. Check. And the same thing goes on with the f2 line, so f2, f1 would also cover a6. So that's how you win. So I think this was a win that Shmelov missed. It's not an easy thing to find, especially if they were basically playing on the, uh, on the increments at this point. But it was a win. And I think it was, it was findable, but, you know, it's hard to pass up rook takes f3. I mean, you take a pawn with tempo. You got your three connected pass pawns. I mean, how bad can this be? But I think that this position is actually objectively equal now. So king to b7, bishop takes a5. So the a pawn's gone, and um, white's ready to play knight to c5 check and push the b pawn. And it's, it's already getting a little bit dangerous for black. I mean, it's not that dangerous, but... A little bit. He's got to be a little careful. He's got to be awake. So he plays rook to f4 check, which is a good move, driving the white king back. And now he could actually play rook takes a4. I mean, this would just be a, a really simple way to force a draw. All right, so the pawns are going to start rolling, and what white wants to do is force them all into light squares so the bishop can blockade all three at the same time. But it's not quite so simple. So bishop c3, g5, here, here. Okay, so we've got two of them blockaded. But we don't have the e-pawn blockaded. And the point is that black is threatening to play e4, e3, and now not e2, which would be colossally bad, but f2. So that threat is really serious. It means that white's king has to go run over to, to join in the help um, stopping the pawns. So king to b4, e4, king c4. Okay, uh, not bishop to f2, because e3 wins. And again, f2 is coming. So king c4, e3, king d3, and now not e2, which would be a colossal blunder, king c4, and white wins. So all the pawns are blockaded, and white just forces the advance of his b-pawn, and he's going to win. So after king to d3, f2 is the right way to play. And we just end up with a draw. Everybody takes everything, or say bishop f2. No more pawns. No more anything. Okay, so rook takes a4 would have been a safe draw, but... Of course, Black is hoping to win. I mean, he's got these three connected pass pawns, 
How dangerous can it be? Rook to f3. King c4 would repeat, but Bonin played king c2. Encouraging Shmelov to self-destruct, I guess. Rook f2, king d3, rook f3, king e2, rook a3. Now, if the king wasn't on b7, this would have been a piece, but of course, if the king hadn't been on b7, white would have done something else differently a few moves ago. So knight c5, king a8, I'd prefer c8, but okay, it shouldn't really matter. Bishop b4, and now the king comes back up. Maybe, maybe rook a2 is mistaken, maybe he should keep the rook on the third rank, but uh, I doubt it matters. I mean, if nothing else, white could play knight takes e6 and bail out, or just play b6. So rook a2 is fine. King d3, e5, so he keeps his pawn. Again, he's still hoping to get these guys rolling. King c4. And now black has to be a little bit alert. I mean, white wants to just play king to d5, king to c6, and b6. And if he could achieve that, he's winning, period. So black has to, to be a little bit alert here. So he plays king to a7, which is a good, a good move. Knight to d7, rook c2, king d5, e4, bishop c5. So, uh, of course, the king goes to b7 now, so white's king can't go to c6. And, uh, you know, one problem for white is that both the bishop and the knight would really like to be on c5. So, you know, and he can't change this piece to a prime minister, which is a, a variant of regular chess. So given the pieces he's got, he's got a little bit of an overload problem there. All right, now he plays bishop to e3, so he's hoping to put the knight on, on c5 now. Rook to e2, bishop d4, g5. Okay, knight c5 check. And now black has to be kind of careful. It's quite possible for him to just blow the game at this point. And in fact, he does. Uh, the, the only good move here is king to c7. Now, this allows white to, uh, to draw easily, among other things, by just playing knight to e6 check and he takes on g5, or he can just go back and forth, c5, e6, forever. But black should not lose this. <coughs> um, if black tries to be clever with king to b6, then he actually, I think, loses. Knight takes e4 check, and there are various knight forks that keep cropping up. So if he plays king takes b5, there's knight c3 check. And white's going to win the, the, the two kingside pawns without any problem, and I'm sure Bonin is up to mating with the bishop and a knight. Um, King to b7 is maybe objectively best. Maybe it'll hold, maybe not. It's not going to be fun. Um, and if he tries king to a5, hoping to, to stay close enough to the b5 pawn to eliminate it, I think white wins. So knight to d6, say rook to h2, king c5, rook c2, knight c4 check, king a4, king d5. So uh, he can't play b6 right away because of king to b3, but he can get away with this because... If king takes b5, again, we've got this fork. All right, so rook to e2, b6, bishop b5. So we're not going to allow black to sack the rook for the pawn if we can avoid it. So black, if he plays with great ingenuity, can finally manage to give up his rook for the pawn. But in the resulting position here, white's going to win the kingside pawns very easily, and again, mate with bishop and knight against king. So it can be done. It's really not that tough once you, once you study it just a little bit. So for those of you who are kind of terrified of the bishop and knight mate, let me assure you, it's, it's really easy to learn how to do it. There's only one tricky position, and once you, you've mastered what to do there, it's, uh, it's routine. Okay, so anyway, that's king a5 was, uh, or king b6, followed by king to a5, doesn't save the game either. So king to c7 is the only good move here. Incredibly, Shmelov played king to c8, and I honestly just don't know what he was thinking here. Maybe he was just really short of time. I mean, I don't know what the increment situation was, but um, this is just, just loses on the spot. So Bonin plays b6, and the threat is simply to play b7, and then bishop to e5, and it's game over. And it's very important and quite sad for Shmelov that the rook can't go to b2 because just bishop takes b2. So the only thing he can try is rook to d2. And this might seem at first to, to save the game, because you might think, well, king c6, I just take the bishop, and um, what else can he do? Because b7, king c7, there's no bishop checks because of the pin. Well, the problem is that white can play king c6, and here black resigned. Because after the forced move, rook takes d4, b7 check, king to b8. White doesn't have knight to d7, but he does have knight a6, and this forces mate. 
king a7, queen, and then either queen to a8 or queen to b6, checkmate. So uh, a painful way for Shmelov to lose. And, and I think, again, because of the way he lost, I mean, you know, Bona defended really, really well for a long time. I mean, so there are some great lessons in this. You know, one is just how resilient a position is. I mean, as bad as Bonin's position looked in that endgame at the beginning of it, where he has minorities on both sides of the board, pawn minorities on both sides of the board, still he had his one trump, and he was able to use it. I mean, he he rode that, that, that sucker into the ground, and finally, um, you know, he not only had the better half of the draw, but actually managed to win. Um, for Black, you know, th there's a, a lesson from, from Shmelov's standpoint, too, which is that, you know, even if you've got a big advantage, you still have to, to, to remain alert. So you have to remain vigilant. And, and he lost his vigilance. I mean, it was a position that was seeming, seemingly impossible to lose. But there are very few positions in chess, unfortunately, that really are impossible to lose. It's almost always, you'll almost always have a chance to mess up if, you, uh, if your opponent gives you, gives you an opportunity or if you, you uh, kind of lose concentration. So uh, a very interesting game from that standpoint. And, you know, it was an exciting game. So a lot of ups and downs and, and different things happened. And, of course, it went all the way deep into an endgame. But in terms of being a best game, it really wasn't that. So that's why I would say this game only finished in 20th place. I mean, it was a great swindle. It was a nice defensive effort, a very interesting game. But can't really say it was a well-played game. But that said, you know, it was exciting and, and definitely instructive. So I hope you all enjoyed the game, and I'll be back next week with whatever the, the 19th place game happened to be. So uh, until then.